You could study for the step one eight hours a day for a year, but do you know how to answer the questions? That's what I'm going to show you guys in this video. Throughout my course of my prep, what I did was I sought the help of a professional educationalist. And one of the things she had me do was to go through a few questions and think out loud. And when I did that, she pointed out that I had a really good thought process and I knew how to answer the questions. And that's when I knew I needed to make a video to share this with you guys. I'm going to show you the techniques on how to answer the questions. This is not a teaching video on theory or concepts. If you want to see how to study for step one, check the card or the description. I'll post it there. Um, this is to show you the techniques and the thought process that you should be having while answering step one questions. If you guys like the style of video, check out the website um, of this question bank I'm using. I'll post it in the description. Uh, they do have another doctor who goes through each vignette, takes more time, and uh, really explains the concepts in each question stem. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Okay, so I'm using Lecturio Question Bank for this video. Uh, they were nice enough to let me use some of their questions. So you can go through and check what you want, uh, what you don't want. I'm going to go ahead and just choose a, bu a bunch right now to go through with you guys. Um, let's go ahead and do all systems and 10 questions. We're starting with a pretty long question stem. So first thing I like to do is jump to the actual question. What do they really want to know here? So which of the following is the most likely diet change the psychiatrist is talking about? Um, so I want to know what diet change. I usually skip over which of the following and just straight up ask myself what diet change. Um, if you want, you can look at these. If not, you can jump up here and read it. So this 20-year-old woman. Um, and follow along as I'm highlighting. Uh, this test mode won't let me highlight, but uh, I am going to be highlighting the important keywords that you guys sh should be noticing. Um, unexplained anxiety for the last 10 years, all right? So in, in psychiatric things, like the duration is really important. Um, she's not visited any psychiatrist because she believes that she should not take medicines to change her emotions or thoughts. After explaining the nature of her disorder, the psychiatrist prescribes daily alprazolam. When she comes for the follow-up, excellent relief from her symptoms without side effects. So he says continue it for the next three months and follow up after three months. After three months, um, she tells her psychiatrist that she's been experiencing excessive sedation and drowsiness over the last few weeks. The psychiatrist finds that she is taking alprazolam in the correct dosage and not taking any other medicine that could cause sedation. Any change in lifestyle, she says, for the last two months, she made a diet change. And that could be the reason why. And what is the diet change the psychiatrist is talking about? So we're talking about alprazolam and a change in diet. Um, immediately looking at these, uh, these two look very common and like one of these is the right answer. These things, like I've never even heard of this. I've never really heard of any of these causing anything. And in these types of questions, you know, what, think about how the person who wrote the question would be phrasing it and want to get out of it. You know, they want to know what you know and what's the most common thing. Usually they're asking you the most common thing. Keep it simple if anything fails. So I'm going to rule these out for those reasons. Now coming to these. I know these both affect the cytochrome P450 system. One of them is an inhibitor, one's an inducer. This, I'm going through the mnemonic in my head, chronic alcoholic steal fen fen and never refuse greasy carbs. And that is telling me that this is a cytochrome P450 inducer. And this one is an inhibitor. So alprazolam, alprazolam, let's think about that. By nature, alprazolam is a sedative. It's used to treat anxiety. So if this builds up, it would cause even more sedation, right? So what, 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 which one of these would cause alprazolam to build up? So um, obviously it's going to be the inhibitor, right? Because if the system is inhibited, then this is like 
able to not be metabolized at all and it would build up and because of that I'll choose that but I'm just gonna go through it in my head one more time why this isn't right because these questions do tend to trip up a few people sometimes so st. John's wort is an inducer if cytochrome p450 is induced it would cause alprazolam to be metabolized way faster and not cause sedation so yes I'm pretty sure I'm right I'm gonna go with that there we go and do go through the explanations guys even if you know what it is go through if you had one that you weren't sure about go through and read that one see why it's it's right or why it's wrong both are equally as important okay another long question stem all right so what drug is most likely to have caused the symptoms in this patient all right um also guys you'll see me like going along with my mouse with my cursor i highly encourage this because you're going to be sitting at your desk doing questions days on end 2000 plus questions and you are going to go somewhere else in your mind at least one of those times you know so going along like this really helps you stay in tune to it all right so he has intermittent fever for two days if you're and just ignore it if you're not highlighting properly um, you know uh, don't be obsessive uh, compulsive about it uh, unless you do have OCD that's a different story um, do see about that uh, getting resolved <laughs> but um, okay so let's keep going he has fever for the last two days rigors and chills he has a high temperature there everything else is okay he has splenomegaly and his blood sample is sent. Peripheral smear confirms plasmodium, falciparum, malaria. He says that his father has been uh, recovered from that chloroquine resistant and treated with quinine. Because of this, because of that, his possibility of resistance, the physician prescribes quinine to the patient. All right. After five days, the patient uh, has improved symptoms of malaria, but he complains of headache, tinnitus, and dizziness and nausea. I know that tinnitus is involved in quinine, like if it is an overdose, because it can cause synchronism. So the physician confirms if he has taken it in the correct dosage. Yes, he has. But he also says he's been taking a drug to control his dyspepsia that could be involving that what drug is most likely to have caused this all right so to me this sounds like it could also be a cytochrome uh, type of question and automatically i see this i know this is an inhibitor would that fit the situation if cytochrome was inhibited would this build up and that would build up and cause synchronism yes that fits this is similar to cementinine but not involved in the cytochrome system nope stuff like this guys it's just rare like i they, like they wouldn't ask you rare things most of the time um no for the same reason now i know a lot of people say if omeprazole is a choice it's most likely the answer and it's commonly asked it's commonly used but i don't see that fitting here with this i see this more as a cytochrome type of question because of that i'm going with that there we go okay um there's a biopsy specimen taken and what are we going to see on histology of this biopsy is what it's asking all right all right not important antrum of the stomach 32 year old man from mexico abdominal pain for the last six months all right all of that's important especially the antrum pain is getting worse especially when he eats yeah gastric type of ulcer endoscopy there's a single ulcerated lesion with punched out appearance that sounds a lot like me a lot like um h pylori to me okay so let's see here what will we see on histology signet ring cells that's adenocarcinoma and that would not cause a punched out lesion that's more like linitis plastica and you know keywords for this that they would probably have mentioned would probably be Lesler trilot sign and uh, like external manifestations on the skin type of thing and 
keywords related to that that I do not see here. Because of that, I'm ruling that out. Abundance of self-reactive T cells? That sounds autoimmune, and he's a male, and just from this punched out, no, I don't think it sounds autoimmune at all. That is H. pylori. That is a good choice. Let's see what else is here. Absence or evidence of destruction of parietal cells. Um, that would lead to pernicious anemia. Nothing here is hinting about any type of anemia. Presence of large amount of neutrophils and limited macrophages. That's hinting at something acute. Neutrophils in large amounts. This is not acute. This is, what, six months? Yeah, so because of that, ruling that out. That was my original choice. That's how I got that answer. What is a causative agent? So it's type of micro, uh, micro question. This is a five-year-old boy, uh, sore throat, headache, fever, and difficulty eating. On examination, you'll see cervical lymphadenopathy and erythematous tonsils and exudates. So I'm already automatically thinking about strep streptococcus, um, but I see this streptococcal rapid antigen detection is negative, so it can't be that. So what's causing it? Uh, what else could it be? I'm thinking about corny bacterium diphtheriae, but honestly, it's not mentioning anything about his vaccination history. If he was not vaccinated, I could easily say corny bacterium. But it's uh, nothing is here is hinting that he has not been vaccinated. Let's go through the choices. These questions can be a little confusing, but if you take your time on these, you can do it. Gram-negative pleomorphic obligate intracellular bacteria. Mm, I don't think so because this, you know, even though it says gram-negative, it's it says it's hinting that it could be some type of uh, mycobacteria, probably walking pneumonia. That he doesn't have that at all. It doesn't sound like that, and he's only five. Um, Remember, mycobacteria don't have a cell wall, and they could appear gram-negative because of that. Um, okay, a naked double-stranded DNA virus. Naked double-stranded DNA. Take your time with these ones, you guys. Um, I'm going to think this is talking about adenovirus, and that makes sense. Five years old, yeah, and the lymphadenopathy tonsils exudate, so I'll leave that there for now. See a gram positive uh, beta hemolytic cocci in chains that sounds like it's streptococcus pyogenes sorry about that but it is um, obviously it's negative so because of that ruling that one out envelope single stranded negative sense RNA Okay, this sounds like it could be para-influenza, maybe croup, if he had barking cough, that would be keyword, but it's not here. Also, if he was not vaccinated, it, that could be a valid choice. And some keywords, if, if you should think of not vaccinated, is immigrant children, or um, the family doesn't believe in traditional medicine, or the parents believe in holistic medicine. Uh, those are some keywords. So, ruling that one out. Choice E, envelope, double-stranded DNA. Okay. That could be Epstein-Barr type of herpes family. Uh, no, that doesn't fit his presentation. And this is adenovirus. I'm going to once again confirm adenovirus is naked, is double-stranded, is DNA. Yes, it fits all that. It fits the case. Submit it. Um, definitely take your time on these questions. These are so easy to trip anyone up, even if you know your stuff. It's too easy for those. Okay, what's the diagnosis? I love these questions. Just asking for the diagnosis. African American female. She just had birth and the baby has jaundice at eight hours of life. Automatically I'm thinking physiologic jaundice. Wait a minute. Physiologic jaundice happens after 24 hours this is at, at eight hours so because of that I'm gonna see if it's down here there it is I'm gonna rule that out you can rule it out after if you'd like this is just how I'm going to do it 
and it's worked for me. Uh, the neonate's red blood cell type is A positive and the mother's is O positive. So definitely it can't be RH and compatibility because they're both plus. Is that there? Yes, it is. Roll that one out. The mother's anti-antibody was elevated. So mm, if antibodies are elevated and the mother can pass to the child. Um, okay, that's negative. Uh, direct Coombs test was weakly positive. All right, the hemoglobin was 10, which is low, and total bilirubin was seven, which is high. And uh, G6PD normal, sickle cell was negative, so it's not those, are those there? Yes, so we're gonna rule that one out, rule that out as well. We're left with that, but does it make sense? Let's find out. Uh, peripheral blood smear shows normal cytic, normal chromic, nucleated, and reticulocytes. Does that make sense with this? I believe it does. ABO incompatibility, that is a um, involved in hemolytic disease of the newborn. If it's hemolytic, it would uh, signal for new RBCs to be made in a uh, really fast manner, and that would make them nucleated. Reticulocytes as well, so that makes sense to me because of that. I'm going with that one.